welcome. Hopefully you're having a, a great day. Uh, it's we're talking it's snowing here, but just north of here or, or, or just north of here snowing a little bit. Um, so depending on where you are at, uh, <laughs> might have a sunny day like in our background, my background here uh, or or it might be snowing, but welcome. We have people attending from uh, what was it? Uh, 13 U U.S. states and three countries. So welcome all uh, that you're, this, this seems to be a, a popular topic that people want to know more about. So today we've got a topic of improving schoolyards for outdoor environmental education and stewardship. We want to right off the bat uh, thank our partners and funders. So you see logos at the bottom. We have uh, two grants that are helping to support this uh, with uh, direct and then also Stroud Center matching funds uh, on both of those. The National Park Trust and our, our grant with them is in partnership with the White Clay National Wild and Scenic River. And then we also want to thank the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Environmental Education Grants Program. Thank you. All right, next. Uh, Tara, I'll uh, leave this to you and then I'll jump back on. Okay. Um, yeah, so before we dive into this workshop, I invite everyone to take a pause of reflection with me as we think about and hold in our hearts the original inhabitants of this physical place where Steve and I um, are employed with the Stroud Water Research Center and White Clay Creek Watershed and the original stewards of this beautiful area, Lenape, in Lenape, this region called the Lenape Hoking of the Greater Delaware River Watershed. And we just wanted to honor them, the original inhabitants here and stewards, and also to honor all the life within this beautiful watershed um, that we are holding in our hearts to steward as well. Um, so thank you so much for this pause. Thank you, Tara. Our agenda for the day, our, our, our roadmap of where we're going for the next couple hours. Uh, welcome and introductions right now. We'll have an introduction to outdoor learning spaces that Tara and I will do. Uh, and then we have examples of and guest uh, presenters. Uh, Tara and I will share a little bit about some outdoor learning spaces at our main campus of Stroud Water Research Center in Avondale, Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania. And then we have two others that I'll introduce in a minute. We will have a scheduled break in the middle uh, to, to get up and stretch um, and, uh, and then uh, join us for more about conservation practices, design, native plants, uh, a wrap up question and answer time. And we have some books to give away. So we have prizes. Uh, so make sure you, you know, hopefully you're able to stick with us the whole way through. You must be present to win the prizes that we will then mail to you. Uh, if And also, if you want to learn more, keep in mind that, you know, we can only cover so much and give some only a few examples in, in just a two-hour webinar. Uh, we have an in-person workshop, if you're anywhere near Southeast PA, uh, uh, that on uh, June 22nd, so save the date for that, and uh, we'll start at the Strat Center. We might maybe also visiting some of our partner schools that are part of our Pennsylvania DEP grant about outdoor learning spaces. Uh, so save the date for that. There will be an event page up on the StroudCenter.org website soon for registration and, and being able to attend that in-person workshop. So today's speakers. Hello, I am uh, Dr. Steve Curlin. I'm the Education Director at Stroud Water Research Center. I've been doing uh, environmental education in both formal and non-formal uh, worlds <laughs> since uh, uh, coming directly out of undergrad um, of 25 years ago. So happy to, to help uh, co-host this and uh, also joining me, our Assistant Director of Education, Tara Menz. Uh, she's been doing this this kind of work for the same amount of time because I we're the same age. Uh, so <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Tara, for helping to set this all up. Uh, we will have from our uh, 
Lucy joining us from our partner in White Clay Creek National Wild and Scenic Rivers. Uh, and then also a couple of guest presenters uh, to show some examples. Uh, Vicki from the Independent School in Delaware and Cassie from Conestoga Valley uh, GE Fritz Elementary School. Thank you both. Uh, uh, that's a quick introduction right now. Uh, you're welcome to introduce yourself a, a little bit more when we get when we pass the baton to you. Uh, first off, uh, this is a webinar hosted by Stroudwater Research Center and Partners. So we want to just uh, mention our mission at Stroudwater Research Center. For the last 55 years, we've been in, in existence as our mission is to advance knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems through global research, education, and watershed restoration. And you see a couple of pictures there of some of our education department uh, programs. Uh, our education department has been around for 30 of those 55 years. And we currently have five full-time staff and three or 13 uh, part-time educators. So we have a lot of capacity to do things on site, to travel with our watershed education mobile lab, uh, or to visit schools and, and other places around the world. Okay, we provide uh, experiences for K, we say K through gray, but really pre-K through, <laughs> through gray audiences. Uh, you're welcome to, of course, sign up for our educator newsletters, access lots of resources, virtual learning resources online, uh, both uh, activities, lesson plans, uh, lesson ideas, uh, a lot of educational tech, uh, techie types of resources. Um, we do a lot of educator professional development. Uh, and, and this one specifically, we've been for a few years now doing consulting on outdoor learning spaces. Uh, and that relates to today's webinar. And of course, we run a lot of programs, uh, both outdoor and virtual uh, programming. So what is an outdoor learning space? I believe this is our first chance to uh, go ahead and please drop a thought into the chat window. Well, first I wanted to do a poll. Um, oh, yes, sorry, you've got a poll. <laughs> a different kind of poll. We're gonna, we've got a poll here <laughs> in Zoom that I'm gonna launch here. And Let's do that first. Her. Um, this is for all, everyone attending here. So, um, ah. But you can all see it. So just take a moment to answer this one. And it's, do you already have an outdoor learning space on your campus? And this can be your school campus. This could be if you're a nonprofit like Stroud, um, or if you work at a state park, wherever. Um, do you already have an outdoor learning space on your campus? We're just interested in knowing this from our audience. And then we'll get to the other question. In the <laughs> Very good. Once you mentioned the <laughs> The poll. We have a lot of questions, so this will yeah. be awesome. Um, so keep entering the poll there, and once you've entered the poll, then uh, go ahead and click on the chat and give us a couple of thoughts as our conversation to help us with our conversation starter today. Well, you know, what is an outdoor learning space? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Uh, what can be included in it? Um, where can it be located? Yeah, let's see. Let's see some conversation starters and thoughts about that. So I think we're good on the poll because probably the last three are probably us from <laughs> presenters. So <laughs> it's probably us. So yeah. Great. Uh, Sixty-four percent say yes. You already have an outdoor learning space on your campus, whether that's a school campus or a nature center or a park or whatever your property may be. And 36 of no. So only about two, uh, about two thirds of you are you know, roughly yes. Uh, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, there's lots of ways to, uh, to use your outdoor learning space. And there's lots of things for us to learn about and lots of considerations for when, uh, for you know, creating an outdoor learning space. So I'm gonna end, we'll, we'll end the poll and share the results. Yep. There's the, yep, I'm sharing it cause I'm showing it to you on my screen. Already. <laughs> All right. So I'll close that. So what are some things we're seeing? Let me scroll through the chat a little bit. A safe place to explore the environment. A nature trail. A space where people connect with nature through their senses. Students learning outside the school building. <laughs> Sorry. 
don't know if you can hear my kids in the background. <laughs> I, I can. Uh, simple or complex as you need for students to learn. Uh, it could be a simple area of wood. It's used for forestry lessons or ecology lessons. A place to learn about and interact with the environment. Interact or connect with, yeah. Place that invites people to get in touch with the natural environment. Great. So these are really great uh, uh, thoughts and ideas. Uh, uh, here is one from one of the national organizations. There's a citation in there. Nope. Sorry. Oh, no. What did I do? I will fix it. Here we go. <laughs> It'll catch up. Backwards. Um, backwards. <laughs> yeah. That, that's all. I, I hit the wrong button. All right. One of the uh, sort of definitions or descriptions. Sorry for the glitch there. From one of the, the national organizations about outdoor learning spaces. We'll go back a slide. Here we go. Richly, richly layered outdoor environment, you know, about strength in the local ecosystem, uh, place based, hands on learning, child centered, student centered, youth centered, child centered, uh, fostering empathy and exploration and adventure. Sometimes we call that adventures for educational adventures and also just play and other social opportunities. This is from Green School Yards of America. So we can you hear them as other uh, terms also. Sometimes you might hear them as outdoor classrooms, so outdoor learning space or outdoor classroom, ecological schoolyard, so all synonyms, living schoolyards, all synonyms that we can use, different term, uh, ways to name it. Uh, we prefer outdoor learning spaces at the, at the, at the Stroud Center because that gives us a little more flexibility in the terminology. Um, all right, here's just some examples. Uh, this one, I believe, uh, Downingtown, right? High school, Tara? Yeah, do you want me to print on this? Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. These are here. my slides, I think. So thanks. Um, these, <laughs> so, you know, outdoor learning spaces can run the gamut of what they really look like. And school campuses can be very creative from using spaces in their immediate courtyard where they have um, just, you know, just pavement. You wouldn't think, oh, nature is here or experiences teaching about the natural world could be here, but we did actually use these spaces for a local high school delivering um, program to environmental science students um, on macro invertebrate monitoring and health. And so this was actually a great space that we, um, students and the principal preferred this space rather going outside the campus because it was safe and they knew that it was a place that we could um, bring in a controlled area of lots of students versus something like this on Stroud's campus where we have these beautiful wetland cells that treat our wastewater. And this is kind of like our campus where we do have a lot of outdoor learning. And so it is immediate to our campus, but this is the space that we have uh, next. <clears throat> And outdoor spaces and learning spaces can look like this too, almost like a laboratory where you have demonstrated research. Here's a riparian um, planting next to a creek of an elementary school and the tags for the trees um, that we used. We did over 300 trees that we planted to expand the riparian buffer of this area. And now it's a space where students can actually learn and take data on their legacy forests. I think there's one more picture. In simple spaces like this, where you can come after field experience to synthesize your data, make conclusions and the meaning making of your field experience. So it could be simple areas that are shaded, which is important. <laughs> and here's some before and afters of some school campuses out in California. So this is a before um, picture and the transformation can just be really, really incredible. And it doesn't happen overnight. Just remember that these, um, these transformations are supposed to meant to be happening in, in pieces and in small bites. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And this next campus is pretty incredible where we have, you know, almost like concrete jungle and fenced areas, but there's, it's like a blank slate. There's an empty canvas there just waiting for potential um, to be transformed into something as like an outdoor learning environment. So you can see the next few pictures are different phases. This is two years after renovation where they've opened up some of that concrete 
to actually make green spaces. And I think the next picture is even more where they've added some waterscapes and more play, outdoor play structures. And so think about this, you know, so many millions of students attend, you know, America's public schools, and this isn't exhaustive of all the schools right in the US, but that occupies almost 2 million acres of potential of what we can do. And on these school campuses, what do you think that 2 million acres is mostly comprised of? And so try to just put that in the chat. Like when you think of a schoolyard, what is the landscape mostly comprised of? We know we have buildings, but what else do we usually have on school campuses that we have a lot of? <laughs> Wait for the chat to populate here a little bit. But go ahead, Stephen, put the next picture there. But much of that land is paved, right, and or in lawn, which, you know, costs money to maintain, to mow, to treat, and these lawn grasses don't lend themselves well to infiltrate infiltration of storm water to recharge subsurface aquifers. That's really needed. Um, but yet these, you know, school grounds play a central role in children's lives and shape their perspective of the world around them. And so this is just a large opportunity that we have to transform that landscape. We're also watershed health. All right, next, thank you. So why do we need spaces like this, outdoor learning spaces? Um, I'm sure you can put in the chat a number of ideas and in um, honor of time, we're gonna proceed. So go ahead and start populating that list, Steve. Um, but transforming these school grounds into living and green schoolyards provides equitable access to so many opportunities. One of which we already covered, place-based, hands-on learning, we can teachers can lead their own field experiences without really having to leave their school grounds. Shade, as we know, that's huge, and it's, it's so important to reduce the heat effect. Um, Steve will talk about this in a minute, but there's so much research about improved learning outcomes, not just in science, but across all subject areas of these spaces, being a part of schoolyards ways to reduce stress, anxiety, improve our health mentally, men mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, physical activity is able to be increased, reflects into our health. And remember, these are community green spaces. Most of these, if they're, you know, public spaces that can be used outside of school hours. And we need these spaces in our neighborhoods. And it's a place for teachers to relax and connect and also inspiration for jobs, you know, and designing, building, and more. And one thing that's not on this list, and this list was from the Green Schoolyards America website, are all the benefits to wildlife, but also to watershed health. And Lucy's going to get more into a lot of the conservation practices and more and how we can really benefit the watershed. I think it's you, Steve. <laughs> Great, yeah. Uh, I'll bounce back in. So there are lots and lots of research on the benefits of outdoor learning or learning in the outdoors. And you'll see this not only in environmental education and interpretation research, you'll see it in research from uh, the state parks and national parks, uh, in addition to environmental other environmental educators. Uh, you'll also see it historically in, in the leisure research uh, about you know, uh, going you know, trips and vacationing and outdoor learning spaces also, uh, outdoors, just being in the outdoor spaces at all. These are just some of the, the benefits. These are really nice infographics. Uh, these are from the Children in Nature Network. The Children in Nature Network website also has uh, a whole section of it just about uh, research. And they've got research briefs um, and they've got some full articles. They've got these nice infographics. Uh, these would be great to share with your colleagues uh, if you're doing a, a, you know, some type of training, or if you want to put something like this, uh, you know, into a, <laughs> another, you know, a venue uh, that that shows why uh, you're doing these things. If you need to do a presentation to try to get funding to to raise, uh, you know, money to to create an outdoor learning space, these would be great synopses for you. These are all, like I said, based on collections of research. So we've got improved out, uh, academic outcomes here as one of the infographics. 
better academic performance. And this, this has been shown in multiple research uh, that's led to this infographic to enhance and boost performance in reading and writing and math, not just science. Uh, because we, all, we always default to thinking of science first when we think of doing something in the outdoors, right? But all other subjects also. Enhanced attention. Uh, so you know, focused attention uh, and, and lowering of, of ADHD uh, types of symptoms, especially if you're able to have consistent expectations uh, communicated to students when you're taking them outside. Enthusiasm and engagement and improved behavior. And then also uh, along the, on the right side here, social and emotional health. And we've done some research in this area also with some partners and locally, but also in other parts of the country in the past. And there's lots of, of, of benefits, not only the, the, ben the physical benefits uh, that you get from being outside, physical activity, uh, but improved relationship and collaboration skills, reduce stress and anger and aggression. We, with that's become a lot more uh, in the me the the media. Uh, if you're if you're look if they're during COVID, right? We all think of you know what are the benefits of being outside, especially <laughs> during these times of COVID, and we're seeing that lots of benefits. Right? Oh, what are some concerns or fears about creating these types of outdoor learning spaces? So if you're bold and brave enough, go ahead and and put uh, put a concern in or fear into the chat. Uh, and we'll we'll hopefully try to address some of these as we go along. Uh, but then we can we can kind of tailor some of the talking points also. Um, yeah, there's there's so many. Who will take care of them? Who's responsible for the outdoor learning space? That's that's a great one. Ticks. Oh no. Um, yep, there's the possibility of ticks. Money, funding, of course. Yeah, hey, we've got to we got to think about that. Now, what if what if people? Yeah, what if people are afraid of bugs, or or other animals? Um, can it be expensive? Can it be cheap? Uh, what is the real price? all the way around, kids running away, yeah, a real concern, right? Um, so lots of great concerns there. Keep putting them in there. Uh, Tara and I, when we're tag teaming back, uh, back and forth, we're gonna be looking at those and try to include some of those in our, our talking as, as we're giving examples of things. Yeah, who will teach Thank everybody? <laughs> yeah. Who will teach outside? And vandalism is a real help. thing. They talk about it. This is a book that we're going to be giving away at the end is one of the prizes. Um, and it's a really great reference. And they talk about vandalism. And, you know, it's not something that you can put everything on lockdown. And um, <clears throat> but it is a concern and it does happen. And hopefully as more people start to really connect to this space and start to steward and take care of it, they'll appreciate it more also. Um, so ways to start and sustain your outdoor learning space. There are so many reference guides on this, but these are some of the top ones from this book, Asphalt to Ecosystem, who is, which was written actually by a woman in California with the Green Schoolyards of America group. She started that group and is a landscape designer and has visited over 300 schools across the world um, looking at how these beautiful spaces get created, how they are maintained and tips and, and more. So some of the, the tips about starting with these um, outdoor spaces are start with buy-in from the principal, you know, run these ideas by your administrators to see if there's any interest, if there's any um, red flags or anything, just even just starting with the creation of this idea. And sometimes it can even start with just a tiny little garden in the school grounds area to something bigger. So number two, um, and this is the most important, is form a team. And I'm not talking about one or two people, but a huge group of people. And we'll talk about how these teams get to be um, form because there's a number of ways, but you want everybody from even professionals in the landscape um, design field to be a part of your team to maybe local Audubon society, parents, um, administrators, and especially students because they can own in on this. And we'll talk about that more. Um, so discuss your ideas with school faculty first, really before going to parents, just to make sure that there is also, again, buy-in from your peers. And number four, 
also with, you know, starting to talk with your principal, make sure that there's um, interest from the school district and to see maybe there are other ideas and other schools might want to start these same initiatives. So it's good to check in, especially with um, your facilities directors as well. And allow enough time to carefully plan. Don't rush into this because um, once you implement, you know, this is funding, this is people's time. It's a good, it, it's a good process to take um, slowly. And remember, it's an iterative process that takes years. And dream big, but start small, get your wish list out there, but tackle little piece by pieces. And number seven, thoroughly document this process so you remember how things started, who you talked to, did you get quotes? Um, who was it that person that suggested somebody else to help with maybe a design piece or a teacher that said they would help with a certain piece? So just document as much as you can. And make this a school-wide space, not just some for, you know, maybe an environmental science class, but get buy-in from, you know, art department, from social studies, from health department, that this is everybody's space to own and learn from and to steward. And again, plan for stewardship from the beginning. Who's going to take care of this besides the facilities staff? Are there volunteer groups, parent-teacher groups that can help with all of this? Are there clubs that might be interested? But that's huge is how it's going to be taken care of. Raising money and funding. We have a, a couple options here at the end that we'll talk about where to go for that. And number 11, um, I think is the last one, incorporate again the students' needs throughout this whole process, their voice, what are they interested in, uh, maybe some accessibility ideas too, which Steve's going to cover over in a little bit here. So building the team here, just a couple examples. On the left, we have helped a high school group um, host a design charrette for an outdoor learning space that was actually going to be off their campus. It was a very unique situation that it was at an actually Airbnb. And the plan, the manager there, this was um, a 10 acre property, and they welcomed students and the school to actually use the property for their environmental science and other classes. And so they brought out a group of high school students, they were all girls, into this and we showed up and helped them walk the campus, kind of helped them read the landscape. They took and heard the thoughts of the land manager, the owner, and put them into designs and um, made a pitch to see what would be the best area, what would be of interest to the owner to create these outdoor um, learning spaces that could also be used for Airbnb, yes. And on the right, we've had, um, kind of creative in-service days with elementary schools local to us that are a part of our DEP grant. And they were able to walk our campus, learn about their spaces, talking about challenges, kind of getting out a lot of fears. Um, we took them across our new pathway across our creek, and we're gonna be visiting their campus to do a walk and talk to brainstorm ideas on their own local campus and talk about what are potentials and realities and have them actually come up with some designs. So tons of resources. We put a lot of these in the attached PDF that we sent out via our email. But a lot of these websites are just so great. A lot of them from urban to rural situations, some that are more focused on wildlife habitat and, and schoolyards. Um, Green Schoolyards America is a major hub for all this information. And they also have a lot of COVID-friendly designs and more. So um, check out their site. They also have great webinars, which we'll share with you too. Children in Nature Network is where those um, uh, the research that Steve talked about was based off of there, so you can go back to reference there. And Gateway to Green is a new hub that we have here in Pennsylvania that's focused on sustainable uh, resources and more for schoolyards. And then a number of these other websites too, where you can look into um, maybe even beyond uh, an outdoor learning space, but maybe your whole campus can become a sustainable schoolyard. Uh, yeah, I will say with PA Gateway to Green also, let me just, sorry to jump in there. Yeah, um, our, our Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection <laughs> Environmental Education Grant this year, one of, one of those is we're working with five school districts in South, or five school sites, not districts, five individual school sites in Southeast Pennsylvania and uh, helping them 
uh, design, create, and use outdoor learning spaces on their campuses. So by the end of that project, which uh, will end at least by the end of June, uh, we'll also have those examples uh, up on that website. So look forward to that also, save the date for uh, near the end of the school year or this summer, we'll have more examples up there also. Right. And so these next few slides I'll go over really fast because we need to get into something else, but there is an actual whole series that you can find on what's called Big Green. Um, it's found on the um, Green School Yards of America website where they had actually four beautiful webinars on teaching and learning outdoors, especially on equity and outdoor education and environmental justice. So make sure you check those out. Um, those are really great and informative videos. Uh, next. And so, yeah, Green School Yards America has um, really great toolkits on how to and where to begin. So much built in over the years since 2020 is when they really started planning these. And we were actually on their committee to help them create a lot of these tools. And the next tool I think Steve's going to talk about is um, an assessment of your schoolyard, how to do kind of a small feasibility study. Yeah, so there are there are a handful of these out there available that you could find online, but this one uh, uh, from Green School Yards America uh, and other uh, school districts have created their own. Uh, we re recently learned about one last week from a, a district in uh, Virginia and another one in, in Maryland uh, that were doing assessments of their, out of their outdoor spaces to see uh, and then plan for outdoor classrooms or outdoor learning spaces. And this is just obviously the first page of it, uh, but there are there are templates available, um, and and we have some of those in the resources that Tara provided, uh, and then you can also of course look up uh, some of those. Uh, but there, it's a great way to, uh, place to start. Uh, it's a you know a nice guiding document. We really recommend using some of these or 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 looking at some of these and modifying them to to make them your own uh, for your school district. Or, or nature center or other other organization and then really you know strategically think about all of the spaces that you do have available and all the different possibilities uh ways you could use those outdoor spaces for lots of different audiences all right uh, we just we want to mention also there are other resources available one of them uh or some of them uh we curate uh, there's others available from the, the resources mentioned earlier, National, earlier National Fish and Wildlife Sur uh, Service, and uh, EPA has uh, Environmental Justice Viewer, uh, so you can see uh, different campuses, things like that. Uh, this is, I want to introduce you to uh, at least one, one of the tools here from our Wiki Watershed Toolkit, which is a, a collaboration of lots of different partners and agencies, state and federal agencies, across uh, the United States. Uh, but the one I want to mention, uh, if you go to wikiwatershed.org, is Model My Watershed. And this is a free online GIS that does geospatial modeling. Uh, and you can model 24-hour storm events and create different scenarios. So let's take a look at one of our, our schools in Southeast PA, Chad's Ford Elementary, right? And we see the school here. This is this is mostly the boundaries of its property, uh, you know, roughly. Um, main road is down here at the bottom, right? And you pull into the, the, the private lane uh, and then the school building, parking lot. Uh, there's a small stream here, Ring Run, uh, that goes into the Brandywine Creek. So those of you that are history uh, buffs, you know, you know the Battle of Brandywine. Yep, we're in that part of the country, right, from the Revolutionary War. Or is that French and Indian War? Somebody can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. Uh, history quiz time. Which one is it? <laughs> anyway, here we go. Uh, we can create a boundary and study and then model uh, anything, uh, any parcel of land, any size and shape we, we'd like. Right? What we do first is you selected your, your land uh, area, and we can see from a USGS satellite imagery and USGS databases, and uh, also uh, some other information from uh, uh, USDA, 
uh, what's happening with the land cover and also the soil underneath. So this is the land cover uh, area that we're looking at. You see most of it is developed space. Uh, we have also uh, developed open space, developed low intensity and medium intensity. So that's our buildings uh, and that's the parking lots. There's a little bit of forest and there's some little bit of uh, pasture or hay area, really, that's the grass area, right? So that's what it looks like presently. Uh, but then, oh, let me go back. What you can do then is click on the modeling uh, and you can actually place onto the, the map different conservation practices. You know, what would, it, would happen with the distribution of, of water during a storm event? You know, if, if this area was reforested uh, and became a forested learning area, right? And we can see the impact on the environment. So this is real good for mapping, both in general to see this current status, but also to do modeling into the future. All right. Um, one of the other yes. things you can do, uh, yep, pass up. Yeah, just one of the tools that we thought we'd mention that's um, been really helpful. One of our um, partners down in the state of Delaware um, in the Caesar Rodney School District created these for all 12 plus of their schools in the district and they were a green ribbon school district. And they use these planograms, which is actually a visualization and design tool for supermarket spaces. Um, they use this actually to visualize their outdoor learning spaces so they can present it to teachers and parents and administrators and um, anyone that might be involved in this process of the outdoor learning space design. So it was a really great way to put um, your words and thoughts into a visual piece. And so um, there's a second page to this where you can see there's a number in the corner and the number then on a, the second piece of paper, second page has an actual description of what you're seeing there. So, um, you know, it has a aerial view right in the center of the campus. I didn't do that, <laughs> but it has a um, the picture in the center, which is the actual campus, and then you can place um, those things that you would like to see there, you know, um, different types of construction, there's a water stream table, um, there might be certain types of lighting, wildlife gardens, accessible features, so this is a great way um, we had this in our design charrette with our teachers, um, we'll probably do this in the June 22nd workshop is give you some time to make a planogram. And now some examples of some uh, additional outdoor learning spaces. You've been seeing some pictures along the way. Um, I'll start us off with, uh, here's a to kind of orient you to the Stroud Water Research Center. Here's some uh, a big GIS map on the left side. We have an 1800 acre experimental watershed that we manage. Uh, we don't own all the property, but we manage this entire watershed. And all of these tributaries to the East Branch and uh, of White Clay Creek. And here's a blow up section of the central part around our building and parking area. And we, we currently have four established outdoor learning spaces, but very much so you see the yellow dots also. All of our trails are learning spaces also. And all of our open spaces are outdoor learning spaces. All of our forested areas are outdoor learning spaces. We consider the entire campus an outdoor learning space, uh, but we do have some established spaces, which you'll see some pictures of. And we have a new, uh, newer uh, pavilion. So let's see a, a few pictures of those. You know, in our stream is an outdoor learning space, right? We're here. We're collecting macroinvertebrates uh, in a section that's downstream from from where our scientists do research, so that we don't disturb their research. Uh, we've got a designated spot there. It's got steps going down into it. So you, you know, if we use these steps, we're not eroding the bank, even though there's. There is grass there, but you can see it's not just, we're not totally um, destroying the bank of that stream by having uh, literally thousands of students every year. Uh, we've got an established space to do that. Uh, this picture here is what is probably our first uh, in what, 2015, I think, uh, constructed uh, outdoor learning space. And this is up in our, at the edge of our uh, uh, mature forest and our recovering forest. And you can see we, for this one, we've created uh, and built some outdoor lab tables, uh, also an amphitheater type of area for when, you know, the students first are, are led through lab activities. 
uh, whether that's water quality testing, like chemistries or things like that. They can gather around these lab tables, but then to really get their, you know, get and keep their attention, we've got more, they can move to an amphitheater type of space. All of these are movable uh, and all are made of just white cedar uh, that you can get at most places, most hardware places. Um, we haven't treated them and they're still in good shape uh, this many years later in 2023 now because uh, we don't want chemicals leaching from them. We're not using pressurized or, or pressure treated wood or anything like, like that. We're just using insect resistant uh, cedar. And we have a kiosk. This kiosk is a, a designed by a, a Boy Scout uh, for Eagle Scout project originally, uh, which is, are great resources uh, to use and part, people to partner with uh, Eagle Scouts and also uh, uh, Queen Scouts for, for Girl Scouts. Okay. Uh, this we have a, a whiteboard uh, that originally was a glass ones at our outdoor learning spaces, but we've recently uh, switched to our Formica product. I'll mention that at this point. Sorry, take them another minute. Uh, but they make some really nice products also that are work for dry erase markers, and they have some of them also have mag magnetic backing to them. Uh, so we've switched to that uh, as the other ones are not quite available. Stump stools are probably the simplest and funnest. Uh, type of, of thing you can do. Uh, just use stumps uh, from the local area, but you can also make them into benches. And here's our pavilion. This is a Cadillac version of a, of a pavilion or a Lincoln if you're, you're more of a Ford person. So this is our, our pavilion. We wanted to try to do be able to do everything we could do in our indoor classroom. It's actually bigger than our indoor classroom. It's got a storage space behind it. We've got electricity and the ability to project. Uh, some you know, additional ventilation. We also have a screen on the side here. This is a whole wall that can move and, and block off this entire side, uh, something to consider because uh, parking lot is over here. And we can block off uh, distractions and noise and, and some of the weather and storage area behind. So that's some of our examples. Uh, we're falling behind on time, so I got to move quickly here. Uh, so we're not going to not going to do a, if you want to write some th things in the, the chat about accessibility considerations, we were going to ask you a question. Uh, but let's just give you some uh, ideas to, to prompt your thought. There are lots of things you need to think about with accessibility. Here are some things uh, specifically to physical accessibility being for humans to be able to physically get to the area, all types of, of people. But there's lots of other considerations with accessibility. You know, location and distance from the building. You've got transition time. So that, you know, when we're thinking of distance from the building, you've got, you know, what, 43 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, unless you're lucky to have block scheduling at your school, you might have 80 or 90 minutes in a class period, right? Uh, the, the ground surface, uh, the, the type of, of, of the ground surface, the slope and any obstru obstructions. You know, ground surface type is really important. Um, we're converting a, a, a small gravel pathway right now back to hard packed uh, regular dirt and grass type of trail because anything with wheels <laughs> has difficulty going through gravel. Mm. Uh, shade and protection from weather, safety and ability to get help in an emergency. I will mention when you saw our maps of our 1800 acre watershed uh, that we we work with, that we work in on our site, we also bring out uh, you know, whether it's in, in this case of a school, it would be a nurse, so they know how to access the area. But we've brought out the every few years the local fire department, the first responders, so they know how to get to uh, the, the outdoor learning spaces. Um, tables, bench height, benches, the height, maintenance, bridges. <laughs> if you got bridges, you need a permit. So, <laughs> so, you know, check into those types of things. All right, I want to pass it off. We'll go to Vicki first uh, and the, the independent school. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Vicki, you should be able to share your screen just by with the share screen button at the bottom. And- uh, Okay, hold on, I tried. If not, we'll make it a co-host and you'll definitely be able to do it, but. I lost the Zoom, so let me. <laughs> no worries. I was trying to be fancy like you were, Steve, and put it on. You got it. There it is. Start with, but then I couldn't get there back to it. We're good. We got it. Oh, uh, um, okay. So, oops. Go back. 
I'm having, um, all right. There we go. Okay, I'm uh, Vicki Yatsis. I'm the head of the Independent School. We're located just outside of Newark, Delaware. And uh, I apologize for the drilling sound. I hope it's not too um, annoying, but there's something going on <laughs> in my building right now. Um, I This is my 15th year as head at Independence, and we're very lucky. We're a pre-K through eighth grade school. And we're extremely lucky because our school building sits on 90 acres of property. And, you know, along with our fields and things like that, that we have, we also have a tributary that, that runs into part of the Pike Creek. We have a couple of ponds, wetlands, and um, we're able to use those different areas with our kids. And we started an outdoor initiative back in 2018. We've been working with Stroud for a long time on that, but today I just want to talk a little bit about the Funk Outdoor Classroom. So our early childhood section um, of our building that includes kindergarten, uh, threes and four-year-olds uh, needed some TLC in the play area. So as you can see from these photographs, a lot of space, but nothing terribly interesting. And um, we knew that it needed, needed some work. And because of the initiatives that we had in outdoor learning and what we'd learned, and, and Steve and Tara kind of mentioned these things, we really wanted to consider the space differently and look at it um, knowing how being outside facilitates social development, improves physical fitness, supports creativity and imaginative play and inspires collaborative play reduces violence, bullying, stress, and also creates empathy for plants and animals. So we obviously want our students to become um, the, the adults that are going to continue to save our planet and do all the right things to ensure that it lasts for a long time. So we actually partnered with a company called Nature Explore, and we kind of ran across them as we were doing research about outdoor learning and play spaces. And they um, offer this program where they not only do professional development for teachers, but they will also come out to your space and design uh, an outdoor classroom for you. So back in the spring of 2018, we hired them. They came out to our campus. They did a um, session with our faculty um, around taking learning outside because um, has been said, you know, teachers don't naturally feel comfortable outside and they do need help to transition and um, understand how to use what is available to them out there. And then they also sent uh, a landscape architect with them who put together um, a plan for an outdoor classroom. Our goals with the outdoor classroom were to provide a space for our students that would allow them to think critically, solve problems. Um, obviously, science, as has been said, it's like the natural thing that everybody thinks when you talk about going outside. Oh, that's for science. But it's for so much more than that. Uh, language, literacy development, math development, visual spatial thinking, uh, construction and engineering. These are all things that can happen in these outside spaces. So this is what they left us with. Um, this is the actual building here that you saw earlier with the classrooms that go out into the space. And then they designed um, the area with 14 different activity areas. So anything from where you go in, where you gather with your students, music and movement, sand, uh, building areas, messy materials, and so we were very excited and um, all ready to go until we discovered that you can't actually build this from this plan. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think you learn uh, as you go along with these things. So it's great to have uh, resources like Stroud and all the different resources that they're sharing today to help sort of do some of this planning ahead of time. So. We went into this not really understanding that you are going to have to look at the actual um, site 
You're going to have to do a site plan. You're going to have to figure out how all these things work. Do you need to make changes to your site plan in order for them to work? So we had the concept. We had our 50,000 square feet of an almost blank canvas, but we actually needed to hire a landscape architect who could take that drawing that we had and actually make it actionable. And then of course, we then had to hire all the people that were going to do all of that work. So in 2019, we hired a landscape architect. His name is Jonathan Chechi, and he has a Baltimore-based landscape architecture firm. Um, we, in fall of 2020, we were delayed by uh, the pandemic, but in fall of 2020, we broke ground on the space. And a year later, we officially opened the Funk Outdoor Classroom. So it was a pretty long process from 2018 to fall of 21, because of course you also have to raise the money to be able to do it. And, um, and what the landscape architect did was he took the plan that Nature Explorer had given us and he reframed it into this plan here. And what he did was he looked at um, activity zones if I can move these out of the way so you can see more. There you go. Um, looking at what was the function of um, each of those 14 areas and could they be grouped differently based on the piece of property that we had and the activity. So if you look at this here, it might be hard for you to kind of visualize what this all means, but this is your entrance where you come in, a gathering space. This is where all of the small building, messy materials, digging area um, is. This is performing arts with a, um, a really nice amphitheater that we built into um, the side of a hill. This is all sort of gross motor, uh, large motor play, balance type activities. Green open space, because we wanted our kids to still be able to play large games um, together. And then this is a stream bed that they built that took care of water, but in a very interesting uh, way. And then there are pieces on this that we didn't actually do yet. So um, sort of to mention, it's a work in progress. You can't do everything all at once. So this is uh, the idea here is for a greenhouse and um, places to grow, grow things with the kids too. And so we ended up with eight separate areas in our playground with the amphitheater, a playground area. We held on to our big playground equipment pieces because those things are extremely expensive, not only to purchase, but also to install. So we decided to hold on to things like that that we could so that the money we raised could go to the rest of the playground. The stream uh, bed that is in there uh, we did not put in a water feature because again, you know, you have limits to your budget. So that's something that could be added if necessary. Our messy materials area, a building area, a garden area, nature art studio area, and a music and movement area. But what um, I think is really um, interesting about the space is that our landscape architect looked at the mid-Atlantic region where we are and sourced um, plants and trees that are native to the region, but also in looking at the topography of our playground area and putting the stream sort of at the lowest part, so that's where the water would collect, and then sort of going from there, where would you find trees like this in our area, so where would we place them on our playground? And so, you know, all the different things that you find, the deciduous forest, where would those trees go? Dunes and meadows. So um, actually in our classroom, there are sand dunes to represent the coastal area of our, um, of our state and mid-Atlantic region. And then planted in there, the things that you would find in sand dunes. Uh, edges and screens, things that we could plant that are native that would provide sort of interesting opportunities for creativity 
and problem solving that are naturally um, growing. Groves that you find. The stream is planted with um, plants that are native to what would grow in a stream in this area. And so as a result of um, a year of work, lots and lots of big equipment being on this piece of property to actually change the topography of it and um, fundraising and goodwill, a lot of goodwill from people associated with our school who did things for us at cost. It allowed us to go from this to something that now looks like this. So in this space, you can see um, this is the stream bed uh, that runs through. Not always does it have water. Sometimes if we've had a big rain, there will be water in here and that allows another feature for our kids when they're out in this space. But what it does have is rocks and stones and um, boulders of different shapes and sizes, which by itself allows for different kinds of you balance. You your head? Everything okay? Um, this here is you know, balance beams for walking on. Um, this is an upside down tree, which is kind of a really interesting creative feature that we put in. This is called a log field. The kids can use large pieces of material, tie them around and make forts in this area. Um, you know, the green space, this is designed, this is our path for um, our tricycles. Uh, so the kids can ride around that path. We kept our swings. Uh, this is the amphitheater and stage area. These are some musical instruments. Um, and here's just a slightly different angle. You can see the stage here. This is the music area with the outdoor musical instruments. And here um, we have our messy mix mixtures area and art, um, outdoor art place, sand um, and digging. Uh, the one feature that was really important that we learned by working with our faculty was that you need to store your materials where the activity is happening or it won't happen. So we used to store materials in this building here and the teachers would have to go in, bring them out to, this, to the playground and then put them back. And what we found was, you know, it wasn't easily accessible. You had to think about it. You had to clean it up afterwards. And it was a barrier to our faculty um, doing some activities out in this space. So we made sure that we put storage units out here associated with each area so that we had uh, places that were easily accessible, things could be cleaned up and put back away. We refer to this one as our outhouse because that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and then we also have a large one here that houses the trikes up at the top here so that they're easy to um, access for the kids. And this is just an aerial view of it so that you can actually kind of see how it's all laid out. This is the gathering area. There's some large boulders here, which is where the kids can sit and gather and have classes. We had a, um, you know, shade has been mentioned. We had a shade structure that was over in this area of the playground. We saved it and moved it over here so that there is some shade out here under, um, we have tables and chairs underneath this shade area. Uh, we had a turtle sandbox. We saved the top of it and that's that does act as some shade here in our sandbox area. And uh, we are currently fundraising to purchase more shade um, as we learn how our kids are using this and where we really need to, to have more protection. And then this past summer, uh, we added a mural to the blacktop area. We have a very large blacktop area out here and we just left it as it was, but we added this amazing mural to it and it features all of the different wildlife that you would find in our area. But here in the center of the mural, is our watershed. And so um, we work a lot with our older students on the watershed that we're in, and uh, we're actually in the same watershed as Stroud. And so we wanted a representation of that to make it a little more concrete for our students. So, um, so we added that this uh, summer. 
And then I just thought I'd share a little bit of video showing how our kids are using the space. That's so wonderful, Vicki. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, oh, it's awesome. I want to go to school there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's um, so the digging area is the big feature out there. We learned that our kids absolutely love digging. Mm. And so it's like a miniature construction site. And, um, you know, the pictures that I showed were the pristine before any children had been in that space. And now there's no delineation between the sand area and the dirt area, it's all one. We've got huge holes in there. When it rains and there's water in the stream, the kids will collect the water in the stream, they'll bring it into that digging area and mix it up. So we have mud kitchens now that are out there as well. And, um, it's, you know, part of me would love to just to put a drone above the outdoor classroom and just record it and see where the children actually go and what interests them. Um, we do not cover the sand or digging area. We do have a fence around the whole classroom, but we do not cover it. And yes, that has been a question that has been asked many times by teachers. Uh, and we've not had any trouble with it or even or with our sand dunes. Um, I mean, I was very skeptical about the sand dunes when, um, you know, how long is the sand going to last there? The kids are going to move the sand. It's all going to wash away. Well, we're in, you know, what, a year and a half out from when we opened it and the sand is all still there. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to dig in the sand dunes though. <laughs> Uh, so such a wonderful space, uh, a, you know, a fully developed space. It can be a big space like that with lots of different uh, uh, parts to it, or can just, or you can, if you're starting from scratch, start with one space if you want. Uh, Vicky, there's a few more questions in the chat as we transition okay. to Cassie. Um, I'll ask Vicky to go ahead and reply in the chat to the couple other questions that were in there, and Cassie, you can share your screen next, and we'll pass it on to you. Yeah, it's starting. Yep, if we can see your screen now. You're in good shape. And you're probably, I don't know if you're unmuted yet. You'll have to unmute for us to hear you. There we go. Okay. Great. Hi. Uh, I'm Kathy Rumbaugh. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Fritz Elementary School in the Conestoga Valley School District in Lancaster County. We're, I don't know, 45 minutes west of Stroud Research Center. And our school got involved with this. Uh, project through the outdoor learning uh, network initiative, I believe it was called. And um, I was just asked to show a few things that we've done at our school. Um, and it, we're still a, a work in progress. And that was a beautiful presentation with really sophisticated things that were done. But I'm going to show you things that are much simpler <laughs> and um, kind of got done. I like what you were what she was saying about Vicki was saying about the goodwill of of people around us. So we were thankful for that as well. So again, it's Fritz Elementary, and this is just some of our outdoor classroom spaces that we've um, established, um, some mostly since COVID. So here's uh, the front of our school. It's an elementary school that houses, um, well, that accommodates uh, 533 students, grades kindergarten through fifth. And here's an aerial view of um, the school itself. This is where my, can you see my um, cursor, my arrow? The, the main road out here is uh, Horning Road. And here's where uh, parents come and drop their kids off. There's the loop in the back here. And this is the bus loop in the front of the school. 
Um, so the picture I just showed you is right here of the facade of our school. There are four main areas that we have dedicated to sort of outdoor learning. Um, this is a courtyard. It's the turquoise blue, bluish green box. And I'm, I'm showing you that because I'll refer to it in other slides. This is the courtyard area in turquoise. This is um, our garden area um, outside our library. And then in the back where the playground area, the main playground area is, there's a secondary kindergarten playground here. Across the bridge over to the athletic fields over here, there are two areas, one to the left, as you come over the bridge and one to the right that we'll go over. So those are the four main areas that we've sort of tried to make improvements to over the past couple of years and still have plans to make more improvements to. Um, the courtyard area, that turquoise box area that you saw on the last screen, um, this was just a simple, the PTO paid for some picnic tables and I believe there are 10 there. It was just a simple, like I said, um, donations to the PTO and then parents came, unloaded them out of their pickup trucks and, and did that one day. We were very grateful for that the year after COVID. Um, the areas that have been works in progress are these areas. Here's that main playground that I was showing you. If you come across the bridge, we've had some improvements done to the, well, on this screen, it looks like to the left, um, but as the kids come across the bridge, they turn right. And um, this is the area to the right and the area to the left um, that I wanna show you what we're doing and thinking about doing. The area to the left, we had an old uh, set of benches and we had like a covered um, kind of easel looking thing that was really run down. And as luck would have it, we had a student who, well, actually a teacher whose child was um, in Girl Scouts actually, and she was doing the, the commensurate of an Eagle Scout project. I'm not sure if it's called Eagle or not, but she came in and built the benches, replaced them. And instead of having the covered easel, like whiteboard sign thing, uh, she put the table in here, which has been so nice for the teachers to use to, to mis distribute materials and store materials. Um, for the different activities that we do out there. Um, there's a little stream next to that area. And so, the, the, you know, we, we use the water from the stream for different water studies and things like that. And the library use it, uses it, especially on um, outdoor Wednesdays, she calls it, or I'm sorry, she calls it uh, Wednesday in the woods. So they come out here and do stream studies, things like that. Um, the newer classroom space um, is, to, as the kids come across that bridge, they turn left. These are just simply um, tree stumps that, um, to be honest, I saw it at Stroud one day and like, it was really kind of ironic. The, my neighbors happened to be having a tree cut down a couple weeks later and I just said, can I have that? And the neighbors were like, sure. And I went to the premier tree service guy and I said, hey, would you take those logs over to our school. And he was like, yeah, that actually saves us trouble. So it was closer than they were gonna go back to their shop and they didn't have to chop them all up um, once they got back to their shop because I had a dad come in and just cut them up. And so there they are in our parking lot after the tree company delivered them. And there they are after they cut up and we hauled them with a tractor and hands, which were really heavy um, to the other side of the bridge, but the kids really appreciate it. And, we have lots of different um, activities and plans that we would like to do. And honestly, I just got this idea by going to um, one of the little conferences that Stroud had. And one of the, one of the um, teachers there said about how their outdoor classroom is just tree stumps and they got it, you know, very cheap. <laughs> um, and, and like I said, ironically, a few weeks later, my neighbor was taking down a tree and it just all happened very quickly. It was really, really kind of neat. Um, there they are working. There's one of my students. Um, th they built a fort out of the, you can see the <laughs> sticks and things that fall from trees there, but they have fun with that. Sometimes they just, at recess time, they just jump from log to log. So a little bit of that. 
these are what we'd like to do <laughs> when we get some time. Um, and again, they just came from Pinterest, but the librarian and I are really into making sure this space gets used and um, she sends me pins all the time about what we can do when we get the time. Um, so there's, this is the area, this is the area just kind of behind the benches and the new table that kind of runs parallel to the stream. And you can see it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty rugged. It's not finished in any way. Um, there's a better glimpse of it. Sometimes there's more water running through this little creek than there are at other times. Um, what we would like to do is get some native plants and or a wildflower meadow on that side of the creek. Um, we're still convincing our principal that the wildflower meadow would be an okay thing because they're kind of, um, you know, they don't look real great to start. And there's a lot of, um, the years go on, there's a lot of, not a lot of maintenance, but you have to burn it and things like that. So we're still working on our principal to get the wildflower meadow, but we definitely want to put some native plants in there. Um, the other area that I showed you at the very beginning of the Google Maps was the garden area. And this is just a little kind of nook outside of our library and our kindergarten playground is kind of tucked away in here. Um, there we, we have um, raised bed gardens that we take care of. And um, you can see, I don't know if you can see, there's three of them. And we have some plans for this area. We also dug a little baby bunny out and I just included that in the presentation because who doesn't love a baby bunny in a presentation? So he came out of one of those gardens and it's a lot of work in the summer when it gets really hot to water these. Um, what we end up doing is putting buckets underneath the air conditioning vents <laughs> and collecting the water. And there's a hose as well, but that means you have to go get the hose key. So if you can collect enough water from the air conditioning, you can water all the gardens without it. But we would plan to get a rain barrel um, and, and hang it on the roof and have it um, supply water to these three beds. The other thing, and it's pretty long-term at this point, is it's gonna be challenging to water all three beds um, with the same rain barrel, we think it's going to be challenging. So we would like to put some effort into the future of consolidating three beds into one. Um, but that's that's farther down the road than this. We are hoping to use our money from Strat. Well, I guess it's the DEP um, to add this. This is sort of what we had um, in the outdoor classroom with the benches where the table was, that it was rotting and it was really kind of an eyesore. So when we got rid of that with the Eagle Scout project, we thought, thought we still need another one. Um, so that's what we're gonna have our tech ed department build for us at the high school and um, install that near the garden area with the rain barrels, hopefully. Um, this is just a plug for it. In, it can be an indoor and outdoor tower garden that we have a lot of fun with and eat a lot of salads in our classroom for. So that's just a little plug for an indoor or outdoor tower garden if you're interested to have more information on that. Um, and then it was great. The, um, the grant that um, Stroud offered included some money for signage. And every summer with the garden, the produce that we um, harvest we put on a table out front of our school and I always just make like a laminated sign that always gets destroyed in thunderstorms and looks really trashy so this year we're going to get a sign that says free produce from the Fritz Gardens for the community and it is great to see families come and pick that um, that free produce up um that's all I have for you <laughs> nothing nothing major but if you have any questions i can always be reached if you want any information about what we've done or how we've done it on a budget um I'm, I'm happy to talk about it it's kind of my passion this year and for the last couple of years and the upcoming years so i'm happy to talk about it anytime with anybody and get ideas from anybody because a lot of this just came from other people's ideas so thank you for listening Thank you so Thank much, you, Cassie. Uh, 
Great pictures, great uh, uh, all kinds of things to consider, you know, from just, yeah, simple things to more complex uh, things. And I, I like how you, you also mentioned, you know, different partners that you were able to get involved. Uh, thank you for the, the shout out to the DEP Environmental Ed Program, the grant that we have, and also with with, with matching funds also from, from uh, us and the schools uh, to, to help create those the different things. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to steal the, uh, if you can stop sharing screen, I'll steal, or I can maybe share the, steal the screen back. And uh, there's some great things in the chat. Uh, FFA uh, uh, clubs at, at the high schools, conser the county conservation districts, uh, great partners, great resources. Um, all right, so I'm sharing my screen now. And uh, the exotic frog says, take a break. Uh, so we're gonna take about a five minute break and we'll start up promptly in uh, five minutes. It's 5.19ish um, now. <laughs> so by five, that's Eastern time. Um, so by five, uh, what's that, 24, <laughs> roughly, we'll start up again. Uh, please continue, we'll use this time for more, uh, uh, things in the chat, and we also do have a poll uh, during the break, so please stretch uh, during this time. Uh, just a, a quick poll you see on the screen there, uh, and, and click on the poll, you should be able to see it. Uh, we're just curious, you know, how'd you find out about this webinar? Um, and there's there's more, yeah, more choices if you scroll, um, so you, you'll see the question uh, on your own there. there. Oh, there you go. I'll put it up so you can see it but I don't want to block the frog. There we go. All right, so go ahead and uh, uh, put some more ideas in the chat and, and, and enter the poll, please. Uh, and stretch, <laughs> get a drink. And we'll start up again at 524 Eastern time. Well, during the break here, uh, we've mentioned those DEP grants. Kathleen, I think you're on, uh, Kathleen Bansky, you're on here. If you'd like to put a link in the chat uh, for all the Pennsylvania people that may be on the webinar about those uh, grant opportunities, uh, you are welcome to do that. Uh, and that's a good prompt also for anybody else. If you know about any um, grant opportunities that could fund these types of things, uh, feel free to share uh, with the group and let's help each other out.
All righty, welcome back. Hopefully you got a good stretch and a drink uh, during our five minute break. Thank you uh, also for everyone who has already entered the poll uh, about how did you find out about this webinar. We really appreciate that uh, because we want to be able to continue to make uh, opportunities like this uh, as available and as, as accessible as possible to everyone and make sure that we get the word out to different uh, advertising venues. So we really appreciate that. Uh, a couple more uh, questions you keep ask, uh, popping up in the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Go ahead and keep doing that. I see one about local ordinances and restricting grass height, uh, restrictions on that. Yes, always check with your local ordinances first, <laughs> of course, before you do anything. Or, uh, your township or city uh, or or whoever the local uh, governing body is before you do pretty much anything in case there are maybe some of those concerns that you might have might run into uh, <laughs> getting around it depends on what the what the ordinance is um, so um, uh, I'll ask others to help uh, with possible answers about that uh, but that's definitely that's something we could uh, if you want to email us about uh, those types of things we can you know, look at the, the actual uh, local ordinance that you might have to deal with, and we might be able to help you with that. And of course, yes, Sally, I mentioned permits earlier, and uh, especially if you're if you're doing anything with water, uh, you're not allowed to move the water uh, that's in an existing stream, or in a, you're not allowed to move an existing stream <laughs> or modify it in any way without a permit. Um, in in most jurisdictions. Uh, so be be careful around that, and uh, yeah, conservation districts and and we and others can can help you uh, with those types of things. All right, we're back from our five minutes uh, break, and we want to welcome our next uh, guest. And if you want, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and if you want to take over the screen, Lucy. All right. And so we've got Lucy from uh, the White Clay Creek National Wild and Scenic River, um, part of the National Park Service, and then also other local partners. So we're happy to partner with Lucy, and we'll turn it over to you uh, and stick with us. And it looks like pretty much everybody is. We're still way, well over 50, uh, 55 people. Uh, so everybody's pr still pretty much here. We've got a wrap up. Uh, coming at the end uh, in the last five to ten minutes and some prizes to give out. So take it away, Lucy. We're seeing uh, the slide and your next slide in speaker view, uh, Lucy, which is okay, but if you want to switch it, uh, you can do that also. And you're you're muted, Lucy. Also, and your your screen went away. <laughs> um, okay, I will try to share my screen again. No problem. No worries. Get an extra right, stretch. Let's see. There. You go. Oh, that is. Yep. PowerPoint. Your... And you should, just to say, yeah, play from the beginning, then we should be in good shape. Yep. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So um, yeah, thanks. And you got to stick around for those free books at the end that, with that raffle. Um, my name is Lucy. I am a trained um, landscape designer and horticulturist and arborist. And I just started this fall um, assisting with the Catch the Rain program, which was started by Shane Morgan, who's also in this meeting. And so I now uh, help to support this program. And to give you some context for those of you, and let me just stop here. Steve, you're still seeing just the one slide, not the two slides. Okay. Um, some of you are probably in the white clay watershed and others of you are not. So just to give you some context, we are designated a national wild and scenic river. And that's pretty, that's pretty fancy. Um, less than half a percent of rivers in the US uh, have that wild and scenic 
river designation. And what that means is that we're locally managed and yet we receive we receive funding from the National Park Service to implement um, a watershed plan. And we have the added benefit of federal oversight for um, water resource projects. So if a um, new culvert needs to go in or there's a bridge crossing, we need to get permitting um, from the federal government for that because we don't want um, the, um, you know, this is an area where it's important box turtle habitat, there's recreational fishing, as you can see. So anything that's going to affect the stream, like the banks of the river and the riverbed, um, the federal government is involved. But for the most part, it's managed by uh, the two local governments, and we straddle Pennsylvania and Delaware. So um, that's kind of how the White Clay Wild and Scenic River um, works. And you can see all of our partners at the bottom here. And for context, here we are. There's that watershed map that was in the mural um, at, at one of those school grounds. And Philly is up here. Um, you can see Wilmington and Baltimore. And there's actually, um, you can see the, the dividing lines between the two states. And there's a tiny, tiny bit of Maryland that's also um, part of the watershed. So we would cover three states actually. Um, and like I said previously, um, we're locally managed by municipalities in both states. And why, so I'm just kind of whiz through a few slides in about 20 minutes to kind of explain our program and how you can relate it to your schoolyards. And, um, and this is um, and a program like ours to understand why we're doing it. We, we kind of look at these land use maps and where we're located, um, looking at this map on the far left, the red is like intensive development. So a lot of, um, you know, that's all impervious surfaces. The, the pale yellow is um, urbanized areas. The green is the little bit of um, White Clay Creek State Park. That's our little haven here. And then the brown is agriculture. So there's a lot of agriculture land. Um, that slide, that picture in the middle is showing that the, the yellow is that urbanized area. So we have a lot of ag up north in the watershed and then a ton of urbanized area. And the effect of that is that a lot of our streams are impaired as you can see in this map. And 88% of the watershed is actually in private ownership. So that's why we started the program um, Catch the Rain because it was a way to try to get private landowners to take responsibility of the runoff generated from their properties while also addressing habitat needs, water pollution, carbon sequestration, and all in the name of beautifying their property, beautifying the watershed. So we have a big impact here, um, kind of on the privately owned level, which a lot of the schoolyards are, um, a lot of the residences we're working with. And we've seen problems arise when we don't manage stormwater. And, um, you know, with all the impervious surfaces around, these are a lot, these are all local examples. The top right photo is actually in the city of Newark, Delaware, um, downtown. And that car in that culvert, if you remember a couple of years ago from, um, I think it was Hurricane Ida in Lantana Square Shopping Center in um, Hocus in Delaware, that shopping center always floods. And this was a, um, a scary situation where there was a gentleman trapped in the car and there were all these people, like eight people trying to get him out. And the car, just as they were getting him out, imagine this flooded um, in this moment because th that's what was happening. The car like whizzed through the culvert and like went through a tube and um, popped out the other side and required a lot of people to have this rescue mission. So these cause uh, numerous, um, you know, disasters that require rescue teams. And this is coming, becoming more and more common. Um, instead of kind of historic floods, we've seen, you know, every couple of years, um, major historic flooding. And those stressors 
are are on the increase. And so our precipitation, this is a perfect day for it because we're receiving all this rain instead of snow, which we should usually be, be having in the winter. But um, the average, we used to get about 40 inches of precipitation a year, and now we're up to 45 inches. Um, and, and with these, not just the increased precipitation, but we have um, they're more extreme. So following the rain events, we're getting, you know, these wind events, we, we're getting tornadoes now. Um, and that's what's uprooting trees and causing so much property damage. So wetter weather, more intense rain events. Um, and these are just some of our local examples of, of how that's affected our community, like the, the Vine Street Expressway in Philadelphia in that top left picture, um, Route 1 in Chad's Ford, where Hank's Place, the little dinette, and the Brandywine Museum is located all around that. And that was um, during Hurricane Ida. And then this was a rescue mission in the borough of Avondale, um, which, again, these historic flooding events are happening you know, every couple of years now. So what's the solution to managing all this stormwater? Well, what we're, um, what we advocate for is basically in the form of green and growing things. So it's um, nature-based solutions, um, things like meadows. That's a picture from the Shoe Meadow Middle School where they installed a meadow. Um, tree planting uh, projects like on the bottom, which was a riparian corridor and, and events like that are things where volunteers are often active and engaged in and where, you know, at a school, parents and, and children could be involved with. Um, rain garden planting projects. Um, we've talked about rain barrels in the event today. You know, those are, those are also solutions things like um, permeable paving retrofits. So digging up your, your driveway and installing a, a pervious system instead or, or depaving altogether, getting rid of um, certain per paved areas of the schoolyard. Um, so canopy tree plantings for shade. So the, our, our program, the Catch the Rain program is an incentive-based program and it's, and it's voluntary. So we, Residential properties are eligible to receive reimbursements of 50% of total project costs up to a maximum of $2,500 um, per property in, in the lifetime. So um, if a homeowner is doing the project themselves, that might they might get a certain amount back. Um, if they're having it done by a company, they might reach that $2,500 maximum. But we're, we're advocating for green stormwater practices. So instead of kind of the traditional model of having your downspouts kind of shoot the water out onto your lawn and then goes into your sidewalks and roads, picking up pollutants and sediment and sending that right into your streams, we want people to slow it down and um, reduce the amount of lawn because mowed lawns actually shed as much rain um, as paved surfaces. We in the green industry, we call lawn green concrete. It's about 90% impermeable, um, whereas paved surfaces are 100% impermeable. So let's slow that down and put rain gardens in and add some shade trees for um, for shading the house, for shading you, know, you when you're outside. Maybe let's take away that driveway and put in something that's permeable. So this is, kind of what we're advocating for in the program and it's volunteer. So um, how it works is we'll come out and do a site visit. Um, we'll assess the site to see where are there opportunities for improvement. Um, maybe they're already doing um, a bunch of things, but I, I can probably already guess that at, at your typical schoolyard, it's, it's um, concrete and lawn. So there's probably lots of room for improvement. Um, we help, we kind of offer all different ideas. Then it's up to the homeowner to choose the practice they want to implement. 
and then they apply for the rebate and um, we kind of check it off and and offer that rebate and um, so here's just an example of um, during a report or a site assessment this is a little uh, smaller project um, probably in Newark Delaware where the homeowner actually wanted to depave um, or take their driveway and do a permeable uh, driveway instead. So they were interested in doing that, that retrofit. And then they also wanted to have a rain garden. So what that looks like um, after it was installed is this. You can see that driveway now has um, can intercept a lot more rain. Um, it doesn't run off as much and go right into the um, the roads and, and then overwhelm the streams. And then you can see um, there's a little rain garden um, that their downspout goes into a pipe underneath the sidewalk and then it pops up into the rain garden to feed that. But I keep, I've mentioned rain gardens a lot. And so I just want to gauge how many people, if you just want to put in the chat, what what is a rain garden? Or um, it could be a one word or one, um sentence just to see if we're all on the same page and maybe everyone is stumped or i'm not seeing i'm not seeing the chat i don't know if you if you can read anything out steve okay so plant a um a layered natural collection area a pretty way to manage excess water absorption. Yeah, a depressed area of native plants. Yeah, exactly. So um, so here's a good diagram that I like to, to show. So it's basically a an area where we have uh, plants that are receiving water from an impervious surface. And oftentimes that's like a roof. And with our schoolyards, we have huge roof lines. The rain garden can also be fed by, you know, um, sidewalks and, and pavements and driveways. And you can see in that um, cross section that the roots of those plants, once they're established, acts as a sponge and it intercepts that water, um, lets it percolate through. And then that helps recharge the groundwater aquifers that um, Tara mentioned earlier on. That's so important. That's where we get our drinking water and our aquifers are drying up. So this helps recharge that versus the water just running off the um, roofs into the roads and going into the storm sewer and that, you know, jumping into the rivers and causing erosion and problems. And um, and usually we, we prefer to put native plants in these gardens and they're designed to drain within 24 to 48 hours. You're, we're not putting these in places that are like, boggy where there's always standing water. We want them to drain because, um, you know, we don't want mosquitoes to breed and it takes three days for mosquitoes to breed and complete their life cycle, um, three or four. So these are usually draining within 24 hours. And just another picture of what a rain garden kind of looks like in cross section. There may be like three to eight or a foot deep. Um, it depends on the site and the type of soil and you, they're planted with really tough uh, perennials, even shrubs and trees that um, can withstand being flooded every now and then, but then going for most of the summer and the year being kind of dry. Like if you think of our summers now, we have really hot, dry summers. So these have to be pretty tough plants that can handle kind of both extremes. So I just wanna put a, like throw some fun plants out there because we've talked a lot about kind of um, conceptual ideas, but these are some great plants because I know that maintenance is gonna be an issue, um, you know, who's maintaining these areas and you wanna have a garden that can sort of take care of itself, although everything requires inputs and it requires us to have a relationship with it. So plants that will seed around um, like, echinacea or coneflower, um, plants that will form um, kind of big colonies. So just like you plant a mass and they'll just keep growing like that um, kind of white cloud in the background that's uh, mountain mint. 
and um, and some fun other cedars like blue cardinal flower and cardinal flower that um, readily seed. So they'll shoot their seeds and then you'll have more little baby plants. And this is at the Avon Grove Library. And once this was installed, this garden um, became, um, it was like watching a movie for people inside, like everyone sitting inside would look out the windows and see the birds eating the seeds and all the insects all over these plants. And there's just so many pollinators and it's, um, it got a lot of um, people really enjoy this garden. So those are some plants that, and they're also very showy plants. And when left up in winter, the seed heads of the cone flower are beautiful. They feed the birds um, all winter long because those, um, the, the seeds are being left up on their stalks. And then thinking about the ground layer so we don't have to do as much weeding, here are some pretty great um, kind of um, good spreading ground covers that will um, kind of take the place of weeds because um, they cover the ground, um, they do a good job of spreading and you basically always wanna have the ground covered. You don't wanna you don't want to see mulch, you know, you want to see plants, because if there's bare ground or bare dirt, that's just an opportunity for a weed to come in. So things like our golden groundsel, um, blue mist flower, and then tons of sedges um, are, are great to add to these gardens. And um, so that's just a quick little uh, plant aside. Uh, let's take an example of a residential um, space that you could kind of think of as, as a schoolyard. So in this example, we have, um, we've gone to the site and we're looking at, okay, how does the water move across this site? Because um, we wanna find the opportunities to, to slow that water down. Where can we put plantings? So the blue arrows indicate where there are downspouts from the house or also on these longer lines, just like sheet flow from the lawn or a driveway. Um, this person had a little stream in their backyard. So that's an area they had been kind of mowing right up to the stream. So in order to have, um, to help with the, the erosion that was happening there, that was an opportunity to plant more trees to kind of have a, a buffer and to just increase plants like trees and shrubs overall. They had an opportunity to plant a rain garden. So when you're looking at your schoolyard, you know, where the water, water is, is gonna be really important. Um, we do a lot with rain gardens, but that can also, um, you know, show you where you have issues with erosion and where you might need to deal with that. So what that looks like kind of in real life IRL is here's that house that we just looked at. And um, the before picture, you can see where the water would be moving and where we're suggesting a rain garden. And this was pretty much all lawn area. And here's what we, um, I designed this. Here's what we did. We, we basically removed most of the lawn except for kind of access areas and, um, where they're coming out of their driveway where you might need better sight lines so you, you're not blocked. But we put in um, all native plantings. Um, we installed a rain garden so that now all that water kind of goes into this garden space and is not running off into the driveway which then shoots down to the stream. Another example which could be applicable to like a school parking lot is this public park, Harmony Park in um, West Grove. So you can see lots of turf, um, there's that parking lot and a rain garden was installed. This was, um, it rained, this was like a month after installation, that top right picture. You can see the plants went in as babies, as little plugs, so tiny, tiny plants. It drained within 48 hours. Um, in that picture on the bottom right. And then um, a few months or maybe a year later, that's the plugs that are 
growing up, there's still some areas where we could use more plants because you can see mulch. But now that the plants are in the rain garden, that is draining a lot faster and usually within um, a day now. So that's kind of a large, um, a large rain garden that is helping to take a lot of the pollutants and sediment and run off off of that parking lot so it doesn't go onto the playing fields and make those soggy. And back to that Avon Grove Library, here's the, um, here's kind of what it looked like before I showed you the pictures of all the pretty plants. So the upper left photo is kind of your standard boring landscape, like there's your foundation beds with all your mulch and not a lot of stuff going on and not a lot of interest from within the library or coming to. And so a rain garden was installed. The top right picture is showing um, uh, at six weeks, the plants, the, the kind of age of the plants after six weeks, the bottom right is after three months. And then the, um, the picture with the sign in it is after, is the following spring. So within that same growing year, and that's a big transition. And the sign that is in that photo, this sign is, uh, signage is key. Like as educators, it's A, it's, um, it's a form of passive education. You know, you don't have to read it, but if you're passing by on your way to school every day or on the way to the library, you're eventually gonna stop and read that sign. Or maybe you'll scan that QR code to learn more about the Catch the Rain program, or in your case, um, you know, that how that meadow is being utilized by your school. Um, it's also, it kind of justifies the space. So if people are kind of questioning the area um, or like, what is this overgrown area? Perhaps you see a sign, oh, hmm, okay. So signage is great. And now I wanna get into some example schoolyards. This is Avon Grove Intermediate School. And I think this bottom picture is their cafeteria. And um, I think in the beginning, Tara was mentioning all the research around um, how plants are beneficial to mental health. I mean, there, there are countless studies about how even um, a person inside looking outside at a tree is, um, does wonders for their health. So if you imagine this lawn area by this um, kind of no parking zone, what that could look like in your schoolyard. Like even if you planted four trees, what difference that would make for the experience of the students, but also to provide shade, to provide um, ecosystem benefit. Um, or that top picture of the entrance to the school, there's a roof line and there are downspouts that go somewhere. Well, what if you took those downspouts and created rain gardens on either side of that entryway to um, to have you know this um, to have an entry that's alive and full of plants and not just plants but um, but wildlife. You know there would be birds interacting with that, so it wouldn't just be an experience of entering school um, on a concrete slab. And I have a few examples from. Philadelphia um, through their Green Streets, Green Streets Clean Waters Initiative. Um, some great examples of at the John M. Patterson School, they did some depaving here. Um, they, I think before this was probably just a paved um, area. So this garden went in, there's a little um, seating area surrounded by um, either gravel or a porous pavement with um, boulders to sit on. There are trees that will become shade trees. Uh, there's a rain garden in here and it's all kind of in one landscape. So it's not like a rain garden is just this um, thing that sits out from everything else. It's incorporated and you wouldn't even know, you know, where the rain garden is in this example. At this school, again, um, there was depaving. So um, they removed pavement, they installed um, 
raised beds for for veggies. Um, there's, I think, over here on the right side of the path is the rain garden because I can see there's sort of a slight depression. So, but it all reads as as one landscape with a path through it. That's a wonderful place for students to explore and um, be in, you know, the maybe the little bit of nature they might experience in this urban school. And then a different approach that's a little less wild is at the Henry Lee School where um, they took away their standard paving, probably an asphalt or concrete playground and used porous paving as their play surfaces. So they addressed the stormwater on site because the porous pavement can intercept a lot more rain. They installed some new trees and it's a simpler landscape. It's not, um, you know, it's, it doesn't have the kind of wild look that this schoolyard might have. Um, and But they did still install three rain gardens that um, you just can't see in this picture. And lastly, my other example, um, you can, um, porous paving works really well on basketball courts. And as I learned from um, Lancaster, the city of Lancaster in Pennsylvania, the neighbors actually really uh, appreciate that too, because the sound and the ricocheting of the bouncing balls is actually reduced on the porous pave versus the regular asphalt. So it's it's intercepting stormwater. Um, it looks like a regular basketball court, but it's um, acting differently. And some more example schoolyards with um, this is kind of a rubberized um, a rubber mulch as your surface for playground with trees and native plants surrounding this play space. And in this picture on the right, um, the there's a water fountain that drips and all that excess water goes into what's a rain garden. So it's you're not kind of wasting water because it's being used by the plants in that garden. So that was a whirlwind and I know I only had a little bit of time to present so I didn't even look at the chat for questions but I'll stop there um, and that's my contact info. Oh, thank you so much Lucy this was it was a whirlwind but it was a really great whirlwind with lots of lots to think about and consider and thank you for those school examples at the end too and it's um, really useful to know about just so many different options you know that are out there and that they are doable and again I think we keep hearing this repeat of just take it you know one step at a time with what you can do so um, Lucy's information is there and it's um, it'll be in the follow-up email that we give to you as well and in that pdf we sent you has um the white clay wild and scenic program as one of the links so you can reach out and find you know, more resources that are on their site. And Lucy's going to hopefully join us at our um, design shred in June. And so she'll be there actually, you know, if you want some one-on-one -on -one time. Um, she's a wealth of knowledge and we just really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Lucy. I'm going to have to watch that presentation over and over again. <laughs> I gave it to you, but I always learned so much from Thank you, you all. Thank all you. All right. So we do need to wrap up and we're going to do just a few more slides here. Thanks everyone for hanging in there. Um, one of which is we'd like to let you know, and this is on the Green Schoolyards of America website. If you're interested, last fall there was a Living Schoolyards Act that was introduced as a bill um, from a U.S. Senator. And so there's so much information about it, but um, this would completely re-envision outdoor school grounds with the goal of providing more hands-on learning opportunities and giving every child a, a place where they can learn and play outside. And this would also establish an outdoor learning spaces grants program, um, not yet, Steve, <laughs> administered by the U.S. Department of Ed. So um, if you want, you can go to this site, endorse the bill, write a letter to Congress, and there's letter templates in the student advocacy kit. So it's important legislation that's potentially coming through the pipes. All right, next. <laughs> And speaking of funding, we did mention the Department of Environmental Protections, um, environmental education grants that come out every year. Those will be coming out again later this year towards the end of the year. But um, coming up um, due in March is this outdoor classroom challenge where you can submit a proposal and 
the grand prize is up to $10,000 to build your outdoor learning space. So this is for all US-based schools. Um, Pre-K to 12 are eligible to, so, to apply and there's more information on their website. So check that out if you would like to receive um, potential funding for your outdoor learning space. Next, <laughs> upcoming PD with us. Um, you can subscribe to our education e-news, which we um, send out four times a year with our online and in-person teacher professional development. We do have a bunch more coming up this spring into early summer, and there's a list of a few of them, um, one of which is Pennsylvania-based, looking at the new um, standards that are coming out, environmental and technology sustainability standards. So that's in February and March. There's a hybrid workshop for that. Um, in March, we'll also be at our state um, environmental education conference called PAEE, actually doing a presentation on this very same topic. And then in March, we're celebrating World Water Day at the Stroud Center. We can probably see some of our outdoor learning spaces if you want to see our campus there. That's a public event. That's March 22nd. April 5th, we have a couple of workshops that will be in person at the Stroud Center, again, on the new standards, and then ones on um, the North American Environmental Education Community Engagement Guidelines, so two workshops on the same day. And then in April, um, we actually have a um, really beautiful educator paddle that's in Lucy and Shane's neck of the woods and our neck of the woods on the White Clay Creek. So it's a, called the Hidden Gem Educator Canoe Workshop. So you can learn a lot about environmental education and how to teach um, programming stream side and boat side um, and the White Clay Creek watershed. So check all those out. Those are on our events page. And again, you can sign up for our e-newsletter. Last slide. Uh, more information, uh, uh, links, uh, a post-webinar survey. We really appreciate you uh, filling out a survey for us. Uh, if you want, if you're a Pennsylvania certified teacher and you want the Act 48 continuing education hours, you're supposed to do an evaluation after every uh, uh, professional development that you're in uh, in order to get those. So please uh, fill that out when you see that email from Tara uh, with a link to the post-workshop uh, survey evaluation type of thing. We will email that to you uh, for the post workshop uh, feedback, uh, along with other things that email, uh, Tara's already emailed and, and emailed <laughs> some more things. Really appreciate it. Um,